<laughs> Ikana Hill beyond here is a place where spirits with troubles and lingering regrets wander. This is Legendary Adventures Podcast, a Legend of Zelda playthrough podcast. This week we're doing some trading, exploring the mysterious ocean spider house, and facing spirits from beyond the grave in Akana and Stone Tower Temple. Part 1. The Warring Dead I had not visited the Akana region in this playthrough before this point. Epona is required to enter Akana proper. There is a fence that needs to be jumped. Once in Ikana, the path forks. A cliff to the east holds the path to Ikana Canyon. A path then north leads to the Ikana Graveyard. I travel to the graveyard. Here we meet Dampe, the gravekeeper. He tells us the graveyard is home to family members of the Ikana royal family. He also says ghosts come out at night. Further north we find Dampe's home and a massive stall child which fills a stone archway connected to the home. A sign next to the massive skeleton reads, Ye who awaken me, battle me. Then I shall extinguish the furious flame. That's our cue to play the Sonata of Awakening. The massive skeleton arises and begins to move up a spiraling path. We need to defeat it in battle before it reaches the top. There are flame emitters placed regularly along the path. They will create a fire barrier which cannot be extinguished until after two standard stall children are defeated. The first time I failed the challenge. The fire barrier slowed me too much. After playing the song a second time, I used the bow to stun the giant skeleton and catch up. During the ensuing fight, it tries to punch, kick, and butt stomp Link. It took about eight hits for my sword before the skeleton yielded. It introduces itself as Captain Skull Kita, a warrior of the Ikana Kingdom. Kita died in battle a long time ago. He asked Link to take his soul and convey his words to his men who remain loyal even in death. The war is over. After a salute, Skulkita takes his leave, finally resting in death. Link then claims the captain's mask from a chest once blocked by flames. After getting the mask, I headed to Great Bay. Just to the west of the entrance next to the fisherman's hut is the ocean spider house. It's one of two spider houses in the game, a bite-sized gold skull to look collecting challenge. The rules for this house aren't clearly outlined, but as with the other, we need to defeat and collect tokens from 30 gold skulltulas. Of the two spider houses, I prefer this one. It feels more like a genuine house. There's a library, a storage room, and a dining room. Also, throughout the house, we find stall children. With the captain's mask on, they will tell Link one part of a color-coded puzzle. Inside the dining room, there are multiple colorful masks on the wall above the fireplace. Shooting the masks in the correct order allows Link to pass to a secret room which holds a piece of heart. After destroying all 30 spiders, we find a man just inside the entrance of the house. He's looking for a place to take shelter when the moon falls. He wishes to use the house and gives Link a giant wallet in exchange for letting him stay. This new wallet holds 500 rupees. Nice. I then return to the graveyard. It was after dark and the stall children could be seen throughout the graveyard. Some of them were marching around graves. Using the captain's mask, I had a group of stall children open a grave near the entrance. Beneath the grave, I found a simple platforming challenge. After passing through that, I cleared a room full of bats to claim a purple rupee, then lit three torches to open a door that was barred shut. Through that door, I came face to face with an iron knuckle. After the iron knuckle falls, a curtain on the back wall raises. Behind the curtain is Flat, one of the ghosts of the Composer Brothers which we first met in Kakariko Graveyard in Ocarina of Time. Flat tells us his brother, Sharp, sold his soul to the devil. Sharp is apparently the one who locked Flat away. Flat then teaches Link the Song of Storms, saying it represents his tears and anger. Of interest, after learning the song, it states, You remembered the Song of Storms a nod to the fact that this was a returning melody from Ocarina of Time. I decided to venture into Ikana Canyon to find the Owl Statue. To reach Ikana Canyon, players must scale a cliff. Sitting on top of the cliff is the Poe Collector from Ocarina of Time. 
he is guarding the entrance. I first approached him wearing the captain's mask. He said Link would not be able to save the spirits of Ikana with that mask and asked if I had another. Speaking to him without the mask, he says we need a mask which contains the wandering spirits found near the ranch. This is the hint that the Garo mask is needed. Putting that mask on, the Poe Collector causes a dead tree to grow, allowing Link to hookshot to the top of the cliff. Further up the canyon we come to a river. Two Octoroths are in the water near a small dock. Using ice arrows we can freeze them into blocks of ice and then use them as platforms to climb a hill and reach Akana Castle and the surrounding area. The owl statue is there. I activated it and then traveled back to Clock Town. In Clock Town, I visited the Milk Bar. Inside is the Zora agent who represents the band. He will ask Link to help him perform a sound check. We perform a small snippet of a song in each of Link's forms. First, the ocarina. Then the pipes. the guitar, and the drums. All together, it forms a brand new song, which is named for an old one. The song is called The Ballad of the Windfish. It is not the same tune as the excellent theme from Link's Awakening, but it is named for it. Speaking to Game Informer in 2015, Eiji Onuma said the music team decided to name this new song after the song from Link's Awakening. He explained, They were looking for inspiration, something that would fit the theme. And since the previous game was about collecting instruments, it made sense that you would want to use this for a band in this case. For us, really, it was just a playful choice that referenced the previous game, and nothing more than that. The song may be just a playful reference in the real world, but in the game world it's deeply meaningful to the troop leader Gorman. He's touched by the song, and rewards Link with the circus leader's mask for playing it. After rounding up a couple pieces of heart, I reset the clock and got ready to venture deeper into Ikana Canyon. Part 2. Farewell to Gibdos Now it's time to return to Akana Kanya with a whole three day cycle ahead. I could remember that I needed some items for this section, though what exactly I could not. I picked up a red potion and a magic bean to hopefully cover my bases, then soar to the canyon. There is a new version of Majora's theme for Akana Canyon. It is appropriate for an area inhabited by ghosts and the living dead. There's a bed of uneasy distorted keyboard sound punctuated by stabs on the bass notes of a piano. There are hisses and high stabs on a keyboard, and a synth choir carries the main melody. While walking around, if we wear the Garrow mask, we can summon the spirits of the Garrow ninjas. They first mistake Link for their master, before realizing he's something else entirely, and attacking. They offer a hint upon their defeat. A dry riverbed runs through the middle of the canyon. A house with a water wheel and giant pipe sticking out the top is next to the riverbed in the center. To the east is Ikana Castle, which is currently shut tight. On a raised area to the west, we find Tingle and we can buy a map. There's also a shop run by the Poe Collector, and a well at the very top of the hill. The Garrow hint that we need to get the water from the river flowing again by visiting a cave in the center of the raised area. We are told that every two minutes on every day, a girl who lives in the music box house in the center of the canyon goes to the dried up well to check something. Currently, however, her home is surrounded by Gibdo, the mummy enemies of the Zelda series, so she will not leave. Venturing to the cave at the head of the river, we find the composer brother Sharp. He attempts to kill Link by creating a poisoned atmosphere in the cave, but playing the Song of Storms causes Sharp to fade away. The spring, which is the source of the river, rises again and the water begins to flow.
In the center of the canyon, the water wheel on the house turns, and then a happy tune begins to play. The gibdo which surrounded the house all seemed to be hurt by the music. They duck down, shaking, then stand tall, their arms stretch to the sky and sink back down into the earth. The door to the house in the center of the canyon unlocks. Inside the cave, Sharp returns. He thanks Link for freeing him from a curse. He also says the dead should not be lingering in the canyon. He says the reason that they are is because of the Skull Kid. He urges Link to go to the temple and make things right. But he says in order to reach the temple, we will first have to meet the king of Ikana Castle. Getting to the castle is our next goal. Garrow hints that the well on the top of the hill is connected to the castle. But to travel through the well, we will first have to meet the girl in the music box house. She is Pamela. According to Eiji Onuma, she was inspired by the Wayne Fontana song, Pamela, Pamela. Pamela, Pamela, remember the days of apples and apples and books and school plays. In a 2015 interview with Nintendo Dream and translated on Nintendo Everything, Onuma said the song was stuck in his head when designing this section. He said the idea of the music box house was part of his design from the beginning. But the secret that Pamela is hiding in the house wasn't decided until after her design was finalized. Aonuma said, When I saw that figure moving around, I got the feeling this child was brave. That's why I created the little troubled setting with her father. Pamela may be brave, but she is also cautious. There is a secret involving her father. And I knew from my past playthrough that she would not let Link into the house. We must sneak in. I knew a mask that I did not have yet would make that easier. I knew of the stone mask from my playthrough of Majora's Mask 3D. In that version of the game, the mask is found inside the Pirate Fortress. I knew through general Zelda osmosis that it's found somewhere in Ikana in the Nintendo 64 version. I spent some time poking around for it and wound up accidentally discovering that the river in Ikana Canyon connects to the swamp and drops Link off just outside Kotaki's potion shop. Still, I wasn't finding the mask, so in the interest of time I glanced at the Zelda wiki to narrow my search area. The mask is in the position of Shiro, a soldier who is invisible. Using the lens of truth, I found him within a circle of stones near the entrance of Ikana Canyon. He asked Link for a potion, which is something I actually forgot about. Luckily, I had brought one, though I was intending to use it later. In exchange for the potion, Shiro grants Link the stone mask. With this mask on, Link is essentially invisible. I used the mask to sneak past Pamela while she was outside and entered the music box house. The house is split into two floors. There's not much on the first floor, so we head down to the basement. On the far wall of the basement is a wardrobe. As Link draws near, the doors of the wardrobe burst open. Inside the wardrobe is Pamela's father. Only, he's not really her father anymore. He's been transformed into a horrible, shuffling mummy. Tattle points out that he's not like the standard Gibdo, saying things like, it's here waiting for its human heart to be healed. By now, you should know what that means. Playing the Song of Healing transforms Pamela's father back into a human. A mask falls from his face to the ground. Pamela rushes in to find her father healed. As they embrace, her father asks what he has been up to. He seems to know that he lost time, but he doesn't remember what happened. Pamela tells him he was just having a nightmare. As they embrace, Link picks up the Gibdo mask. A mask that looks so real, the Gibdo will mistake him for a mummy like them. Speaking to Game Informer in 2015, Aonuma touched on his inspiration for the fate of Pamela's father. He said it was a little hard to explain. It sounds like there are some elements of the story that would really only make sense to a Japanese speaker. But he boiled it down to this. I was researching one particular character and thinking about mummies. I ended up getting really into it and reading a lot about mummies and thinking about how I would never want to be made into a mummy. But then the more I got into it, the more I started to entertain the possibility. When we were coming up with the Gibdo enemies in the game, there was a lot of Japanese wordplay that went on. Sometimes one thing just led to another, and it brought us to an entirely new episode as an idea. With this mask in hand, we can head to the well above the music box house on the hill. Beneath the well is a mini dungeon of sorts. Its name and location may conjure up images of the bottom of the well from Ocarina of Time, but this is actually a much different space. I doubt anyone would find this space scary. 
It's a series of item puzzles adventure game style. Gibdo stand at doors that are barred shut and demand an item. They have or won't name the item directly. This is where the puzzle aspect comes into play. The area beneath the well is all one floor, and it's divided roughly into two wings, a west wing and an east wing. As I made my way through, I cleared out the west wing first and then tackled the east. I don't know if this is the only way through, but it's how things played out for me. I felt like I could recall needing magic beans and a potion to get through the well. That's why I bought the potion and the bean before coming. And sure enough, the first room contains two Gibdo, one blocking the door to the west wing and one to the east. The Gibdo at the east wing wants something delicious to chomp on, something that sprouts when watered. Beans, of course. But it wants five of them, and I only brought one. So I soared to the swamp and bought four more. I then went to Clock Town to buy a red potion, because again, I was pretty sure I would need one. When I ran into a temporary dead end on the east wing, I returned to the first room and spoke to the Gibdo guarding the west wing. It wanted a potion, but it wanted blue, not red. I left and rode the river down to Katake's shop. She sells blue potion, but does not have the ingredients currently to make any. To get her the ingredients, we need to don the Mask of Sense and find magic mushrooms. There are some in the mysterious forest. They're found in the last area where we find Koume injured. I grabbed those mushrooms and after a brief wait, bought a blue potion before returning beneath the well. Thankfully, the rest of the items needed to complete the Beneath the Well mini dungeon are found inside the well. They include something deliciously fresh, a fish, something small and creepy, bugs, ten refreshing blasts, bombs, and good old H2O, among others. In the west wing, there is a fairy fountain. In the east wing, we have to defeat a big Poe in order to make our way to the end of the mini dungeon to find the mirror shield. The shield is different in appearance from the shield in Ocarina of Time. It features a distressed face on the back. This face is the same as one that we see on the Happy Mask Salesman's pack. Alnuma explained why in an interview with Nintendo Dream. He said, The mask came first. When the mirror shield was being designed, we wanted to have some kind of pattern for the reflection. Having said that, it was hard to come up with a pattern for the shield. We clearly couldn't make it like the shield from Ocarina of Time, and that shape was too detailed. It wouldn't fit the image of this game. But the happy mask salesman is carrying a mask which has a face of distress. So wouldn't it be interesting to use that one? Therefore, the mirror shield was born from what was previously a mask of the happy mask salesman. Anuma said he was surprised by the design at first, but ultimately felt that it fit the look of the world. After getting the mirror shield, we can use it to reflect light at a large block with a sun symbol on it. This causes the block to dissolve away. We can then climb out of the well and enter Ikana Castle. This is another mini dungeon, or perhaps it's just part of one large mini dungeon? Ikana Castle spans two floors, spread across both exterior and interior areas. There are Garrow hidden in the exterior area. They will let us know that the Rededs inside the castle were once part of a dance troupe. They also hint at a second entrance to the castle other than the well. Inside the castle we find a Rededd just inside the entrance. If we are wearing the Gibdo mask, they believe us to be one of them and they will dance as they did in life. There are doors in each cardinal direction of the compass in this first room. The western door is the one that we entered from. The eastern door is blocked by a sunblock. The door to the south is barred shut and has to be opened by melting a frozen eye switch. Heading that direction, however, quickly reveals that it's a dead end with another sunblock preventing Link from moving forward. The goal is to get light into the southern and central rooms so that we can advance through the dungeon. So we start by going through the northern door. We have to melt a second eye switch to open this door. Inside we find a sort of variation of the falling ceiling that we saw in the forest temple back in Ocarina of Time. This one starts on the ground and cannot be climbed on. Hitting a crystal switch causes it to raise. However, the only safe space beneath it is a raised area which can't be climbed. There are Deku flowers on the floor, however. By using the Deku mask and entering a Deku flower, we can avoid being crushed. We can also raise the ceiling again by shooting Link out of the flower. Using the flower, we can then fly to the raised area. It has a floor switch on it. Transforming back into a human, we can press the switch and open the exit. After passing through another challenge room centered around the Deku flower, we climb to the roof of the castle. A garrow on the roof will provide a hint about how to defeat King Ikana. And hitting a floor switch on a pillar to the west of the castle causes a block to shift, revealing a hole that allows light to enter the southern room of the castle. In the southern section of the mini-dungeon, we have another fight with Wizrobe, 
the mini boss that we fought twice in Snowhead Temple, and returns for a third rematch here. I'm not particularly a fan of this mini boss. This time it uses a fire elemental attack rather than the ice element we saw in Snowhead. Otherwise, it's the same. Wizrobe moves between fixed points in the room. He will send out multiple copies to confuse players after taking a few hits. Once he falls, we can move up to the roof again. In the center of the roof, we find a cracked, depressed area that's just asking to be destroyed, but neither bombs nor the Goron ground pound break it. Turns out a powder keg is needed, so once again I found myself having to soar away from Akana to pick up an item. I bought a powder keg in Clocktown and then quickly re-entered the castle through a hole in the outer wall. The mirror shield is needed to dissolve a sunblock, which means that we can only enter the castle through this way after completing the well. After backtracking to the roof, I use the powder keg to blow a hole in the ceiling. This allows light to stream into the central room, allowing us to advance to the boss. As we enter the throne room, a cutscene shows curtains closing to block light from the room. King Akana and his lackeys appear, and the fight begins. The fight is split into two distinct rounds. King Akana and his lackeys are variations on Stalfos. In the first round, we fight the two lackeys. We must first use fire arrows to burn away the curtains, preventing light from entering the room. The king obviously isn't happy about us doing that. We then lend hits on each lackey until they fall down, and then use the mirror shield to reflect light on them. Once the light hits them, they dissolve away. Once both lackeys fall, the second round against King Akana begins. This round plays out much the same as the first. The king is much larger and has an additional attack where he detaches his head and sends it flying around the room. During this phase, the king's body becomes intangible and we can't land hits until his head is back on his body. Once he falls, we can again use the light to dissolve him away. After the bosses are defeated, we get a comical scene where the king's lackeys argue. Speaking to Nintendo Dream in 2015, Eiji Onuma said, This fight and the scene that follows are his favorite in the game. I think it's interesting even now, he said. That is because I also wrote the script myself. As the lackeys' argument devolves into a round of name-calling, King Ikana silences them. He asks Link to return the true light to Ikana by sealing the doors to Stone Tower, and provides him a soldier with no heart, created by a new song, The Elegy of Emptiness. The song creates a statue in the likeness of Link, but it's a little off. The face of the human Link is especially noted as being kind of creepy. Speaking to Nintendo Dream about the statue, Onuma said, Seeing that for the first time made a strong impression too, like, What's this? This really looks like an empty shell. With the Elegy of Emptiness, we can make a shell for each of Link's forms, though we will really only use three of them, the human, Goron, and Zora forms. Part 3, Stone Tower Stone Tower stands on the northeast side of Ikana Canyon. With Stone Tower, the dividing line between the dungeon itself and the lead up to the dungeon is blurred somewhat. The temple stands at the top of the tower. Its entrance is shaped like a face. We must climb the tower to reach the entrance. Though we are not in the temple proper, the dungeon music is already playing. It's the most melodic piece of dungeon music in either Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask. A flute and what sounds to me to be a dulcimer trade-off playing a somewhat jaunty melody line, it floats above a bed of moody choir and another wind instrument that's perhaps a bassoon. The backing track gives the piece a hint of darkness. We climb up the tower using the Elegy of Emptiness. Each section of the tower sees players using the hookshot to ascend partway up the tower. There are floor switches along the way which players must stand on and use the Elegy of Emptiness to keep them depressed with a statue. These switches cause floating blocks to shift in place that are needed to platform to the next section of the tower, where again the hookshot is used to reach more switches. In my notes, I have written that I used the Elegy of Emptiness to play statues something like nine times in order to reach the top. We find an owl statue just opposite of the entrance of the dungeon. Once I activated the statue, I reset the clock, slowed time, and then gathered a few items in order to take on the temple itself. We have to play the Elegy three more times to put platforms in place that allow us to cross to the temple proper. Stone 
stone tower spans only two floors, a ground level and a basement level, but its appearance on the map is deceptive. It should not take long for players to notice that objects such as treasure chests sit on the ceiling. That is our first hint, stone tower rotates to flip on its head, essentially turning a two-floor dungeon into a four-floor dungeon. Speaking to Nintendo Dream in 2015, Al Numa said the idea for Stone Tower flipping was in place at the very start of designing the Ikana region. He traced this idea back to the Twisting Corridor seen as Link entered Termina for the first time, and the Twisting Corridors in the Forest Temple in Ocarina of Time. He said, When you first turn into Deku Link and go into the Clock Tower, isn't the corridor warped? It was the same with a corridor in the Forest Temple in Ocarina of Time. To tell the truth, the data was used as it was, but the viewpoint was changed. In Ocarina of Time, you could walk the Twisted Corridor and the shape didn't change, but in the N64 version of Majora's Mask, it looked like the corridor was twisting and squeezing while walking. I have thought of a room twisting and going upside down as an interesting mechanism since Ocarina of Time. The temple is divided into two distinct parts, separated by the ability to flip the temple. This was also the first dungeon to not introduce a new transformation for Link. Instead, the temple will make use of all three previous transformations. The first section of the dungeon is largely built on a looping path. When we first enter the temple, we are forced left. The path to the right is blocked by a sunblock. We have to use the Elegy of Emptiness and a box to depress four switches to advance forward. It took me a lot longer to figure out how to advance past this point than it really should have. There's a locked door that we need to get through and a set of stairs leads to a basement level where we can find a sunblock in lava and some Armo statues. A shaft in the ceiling is clearly intended to let in light, but it's closed. I spent a long time looking for some sort of switch before realizing I could just bomb that obvious square on the ground over the shaft. With the light now able to reach the basement, we dissolve the sunblock to find the chest with a map. Defeating the Armos reveals a chest with the key needed to advance. Through the locked door, we find an area filled with water that's clearly intended to be explored as Zora Link. This is the second point where I had trouble figuring out how to advance. There are two rooms connected by an underwater tunnel. The second room is the location we need to go in order to advance. There is a locked door leading to the north, and a mirror on the wall next to a sunblock to the south. I found figuring out how to use this mirror a finicky process. It's clear we're supposed to use it to somehow bounce light onto the sunblock and dissolve it but how to do so is not immediately clear. Turns out we can charge this mirror by shining a light on it in such a way that it glows, but does not project a beam of light outwards. Holding a light on the mirror during this glowing state charges it up, and it will project light outward even when there's not light being shown on it. We need to charge it enough to project light and then quickly use the projected light to dissolve the sunblock. Only this isn't the path forward. This loops us around to the start of the dungeon. It also hides a chest with a compass. I had to turn to a walkthrough to find the key. The solution felt unintuitive to me, but perhaps others were able to pick up on it. In the first water room, there is a Dexy hand enemy above the door to the tunnel that connects the two rooms. From my experience in the Great Bay Temple, I'd come to understand that these should be avoided. They don't hurt Link, but they are annoying and will grab him and throw him. In the Great Bay Temple, they always seem to throw Link away from the path forward in the dungeon. Here, we're supposed to actually use it on purpose to reach an otherwise unreachable area with a chest and key inside. The path through the locked door will see us solving a puzzle involving multiple mirrors before advancing to a room that we're intended to cross in Deku form. We can see a pool of lava on the lower level. Transforming into a Goron and then taking on that lava pool will allow us to access a treasure chest containing a stray fairy. And it's in this room that I made the decision to give up on collecting stray fairies in this dungeon. We need to step on a switch on one side of the room to lower a fire barrier that surrounds a switch on the other side. We're then supposed to quickly Goron roll to the other side and press that switch. I could never make it to the other switch in time. I tried for about 10 minutes and got close a number of times, but I would often hit an obstacle preventing me from reaching the second switch before the fire barrier reactivated. I decided it just wasn't worth it. I never collected all the fairies in Stone Tower Temple on my first playthrough of Majora's Mask on 3DS either. I understand that the reward is a two-handed sword similar to the Bigoron sword, but that, for me, wasn't incentive enough to keep trying. Moving forward, we come across the first mini-boss of the dungeon. This fight is against the Garrow Master. It's not unlike the fight against the standard Garrow, but Link's shield will not stun it. We must avoid its attack. 
It will then pause briefly allowing us to get in a hit. After a few hits, it starts to disappear mid-attack. It will then drop down from the ceiling on Link from above. After taking enough damage, it falls. Before dying, it offers a hint to shoot the red emerald outside the temple with the sacred golden light. A chest then appears with the dungeon item, the light arrows. We can use these to activate sun switches, dissolve sun blocks, and flip the temple. As we move down the looping path, we'll come across a reimagined classic enemy. A beetle enemy that we first saw in the woodfall area of the swamp is now wearing a mask, which can be pulled off with the hookshot. It's similar to the Helmosaur enemies seen in Link's Awakening. We also run into an Igor, a reimagining of an enemy from A Link to the Past. Here we fight it in a narrow space and must avoid its attacks to get it to open its eye wide. We can shoot the eye with an arrow when it's opened wide and turns yellow. We then head outside the front entrance of the dungeon. The red emerald is located just below the entrance. We have to use the Elegy of Emptiness to line up platforms so that we can shoot it. Once we do, Link's whole world is flipped upside down. The dungeon music shifts. We get a new arrangement that is very similar to the original, but manages to create a new feeling. The backing track has a higher, thinner quality to it, and there's an element added that sounds like a reversed instrument. The parts between the flute and the dulcimer on the melody line have also been reversed, with the dulcimer taking the first part and the flute taking the second. The second segment of the dungeon is also built on a sort of loop, though this one is not as straightforward. Players will have to double back on themselves after acquiring the boss key, and they will have to have a better understanding of how the space connects. The flipping mechanic will appear again, but it's limited to only two rooms. There is never a need to flip the tower from the outside again. I did, but only because I wasn't paying as close of attention to my surroundings as I should have. The Deku form is used most in this section though the Goron and human forms are also needed. When we first re-enter the temple, we have to head right, and navigate a room with updrafts as Deku Link to find a switch to reveal a chest with a key. We then proceed through a door high on the wall. This brings us to the first room we have to flip. Flaming debris drops from the ceiling, and looking up we can see that a pool of lava is currently resting on the ceiling. Using the light arrows, we can flip the room and then turn into Goron Link to safely cross. After crossing, we flip the room again. In the following room, we have to move a block from the northeast corner of the room to the southwest corner, but it has raised and lowered sections on the floor that prevent us from pushing the block directly from one side of the room to the other. We must flip the room back and forth in order to push the block across the room and into place. I had to flip the room four times to get the block into its place. We face too many bosses in the second half of the dungeon. The second is yet another rematch against Wizrobe. The arena is much larger than any other that we faced Wizrobe in. The fight really isn't any more difficult, however. I did run out of arrows at this point of the dungeon, which I'd used in all past fights against Wizrobe, but the sword is still effective in dealing damage. Two rooms involving Deku flowers to fly over gaps follow. In the first of these, there are a number of Poes, and a room located high on the western wall that we're supposed to notice. We can reach this door by flying. I missed it on my first time passing through this room. A key is hidden inside the room. It's guarded by a new form of the Armos enemies, which fly and try to crush Link. To defeat them, we have to use light arrows to flip them upside down, and then get them to slam into the ground on their head. It's a super annoying enemy, and I ended up using the stone mask to just walk past them. After flying across a second room, we loop back to that very first updraft room, but this time we're inside an enclosed hallway within the room. At the end is the third mini-boss of the dungeon. The third mini-boss is Gomas, a figure which strongly resembles the Grim Reaper. Gomas is surrounded by a flock of bats. We're intended to use light arrows to cause the bats to scatter, exposing a weak spot on Gomas' body. I entered the fight with my magic meter empty. At first, I tried shooting the bats with the bow, but that seemed to award only arrows in return. After attacking the bats with the sword, I scored some magic refills, and I was able to clear the bats away from Gomas using light arrows. Once the bats are pushed away, Gomez's weak spot is revealed. I cleared the bats and then landed hits on him five times. Once he falls, we can claim the boss key. Here we're intended to retrace our steps just a short way through the enclosed hallway and using the Deku flower to fly across the gap. There's a door in the southwest corner of this room. This returns us to the front entry room, but we're on a ledge that was previously out of reach. 
We fly across another gap and avoid a flying Armos enemy to press a floor switch and reveal a chest. We can use the hookshot to then reach a hallway which on the first loop through the dungeon brought us back to the entry. Down this hallway we will fight a second Igor. Defeating it reveals a chest with a new mask inside. The Giant's Mask. The game does not consider this a transformation mask, although it is almost kind of one. It makes Link giant, but it only works in the boss room of this dungeon. Players cannot use it anywhere else in the game, so it's not categorized with the other transformation masks. Continuing down the hall brings us to the boss room. We dive down a pit to find ourselves transported to a strange desert area. Here we face the boss, Twin Mold. It's a pair of giant worms, one red, one blue. The name implies they are perhaps related to Moldorm, the worm enemies seen in the original game A Link to the Past and Link's Awakening. This seems to be the most common interpretation I see anyway, but the fight doesn't really play out the same way as it did in those past games. The worms dive into and emerge from sand, which perhaps more closely resembles the Len Mola enemy which we saw in those same three games. In any case, the worms have weak points on both their heads and tails. The idea is to turn giant to make hitting these weak points easier. It is difficult to move through the sand in Link's original size. However, I did not enter the boss fight with a full magic meter, and the giant's mass consumes magic while Link uses it. I ran out before defeating either worm. There are ruins in the arena which can be destroyed to get magic, though the idea is to destroy them as a giant. I went a long time luring worms to the ruins to destroy them to reveal a magic container but then I would struggle with actually collecting the needed container. Most of the runes in the arena were destroyed before I finally refilled my magic. Once I was able to become giant again, I defeated the red worm. I ran out of magic again, but I was able to refill it more quickly the second time around. While chasing down the blue worm, I ended up walking out of bounds and find myself back at the dungeon entrance. Since I was going to have to hike back to the boss room anyway, I went ahead and soared back to Clock Town, where I restocked, including a green potion, and I refilled my magic meter. Returning to the temple and the boss room, I made quick work of the bosses when I re-entered with a full magic meter. I didn't even need the green potion. After collecting Twin Mold's remains, we again find ourselves atop the massive tree stub in the strange spiritual realm. The last of the four giants is there. This giant tells Link and Tattle to call them, but she notes the giant sounds sad. It doesn't want to confront the Skull Kid. The giant's parting words are, forgive your friend. We reset the clock and return to the first day. Next week we find out why the giant seems sad about confronting the Skull Kid. We'll also help reunite Anju and Cafe before returning to the clock tower and traveling to the moon for the final confrontation. If you want to follow along and you haven't already, please subscribe. Please also consider sharing this podcast with a friend. To everyone who has already subscribed, thank you! The number of people who have subscribed and are following along is more than I ever thought I would see with this little podcast. I really appreciate you liking what I'm doing enough to follow along. I am Paul Riley, and I will see you next week.